Hello and welcome to our Give Love Bradford podcast, where we'll be delving into conversations being held across the district and learning more about how we can come together to create positive change for the communities that need it the most. Give Bradford supports hundreds of charities and voluntary groups across Bradford addressing inequalities. We invest in these groups by distributing grants and sharing advice, acting as a catalyst for positive change. Today's host is Steph Taylor, Director at Give Bradford. Hi, my name's Steph Taylor, Director at Give Bradford. Welcome to our very first Give Love Bradford podcast. In today's episode, we'll be talking about how local communities have been affected by the pandemic, how we've responded through our work, in particular, the Give Bradford Resilience Fund, and we're gonna share some of our plans moving forward. First, we're going to look at the key impact that COVID-19 has had on the third sector and communities across Bradford. And the first thing to say really is that service delivery has been through the roof. It's, you know, it's increased hugely for charities of all kinds. And there's a real recognition um, now, I think, from community organisations that I speak to that what were first thought to be temporary changes are probably here for the longer term. Um, there's a lot more home working, lots of use of virtual and, and far fewer use of buildings for obvious reasons, um, but also lots of concerns about the viability of that in the long term. So lots of organisations trying to work out, can they keep delivering services online and is that the best thing for the people in communities that need them? The second um, big impact is about funding and financial viability. And you would expect me to say that at Give Bradford, uh, but loads of organisations that we talk to and that have been surveyed across the district have said that that's their biggest concern, particularly because support mechanisms from government and others are reducing. Um, lots of community organisations didn't use the furlough scheme or didn't receive business grants in the first place. Um, so they've been spending down their reserves and have got a lot less money coming in. And the third thing to highlight in terms of the impact from COVID has been on the overall resilience of our communities. So if you think about a charity or a community organisation like a person, you know, the experiences of the COVID crisis have been really different for all of us. Uh, and people's experiences of lockdown and recovery look really different. Um, there's huge pride in the district about people being able to continue delivering services. Lots of new opportunities and lots of self-confidence actually from being able to respond in different ways. But also significantly organisations feeling that they're very concerned about the future, how much longer they can go on like this um, and whether their organisations are going to be fit for purpose into the future. So what have we been doing about this at Give Bradford over this time? Firstly, I guess we've been able to secure money. So um, we've been able to very quickly secure about 2.5 million for the sector in Bradford. Some of this was from our existing funds that we distributed more quickly. And a lot of it was new money from our supporters, both local and national, who were really motivated to give to the, the district at this crucial time. And we recognised at Give Bradford back in April that the longer term resilience of the charities that we all rely on was at threat. So we've given out both short-term COVID-19 response funding, but also longer-term support through the Give Bradford Resilience Fund. The Give Bradford Resilience Fund provides both money and support to organisations across the district, so they can both continue their vital work, but also plan for the future. So they might be changing their operating models, they might be exploring new income streams, and they might be making sure that they stay representative of the communities that they serve. And we know there are really significant differences in how different communities have been and will continue to be affected by the pandemic. So we also made sure that we prioritise our funds reaching those who otherwise might not receive money at this time. We're joined today by two organisations that have received Give Bradford funds and who will be talking to us about how they're supporting their local communities and the challenges and opportunities that they've faced over the past nine months. So I've got with me Sharat Hussain today, who's received funding from us recently through the Give Bradford Resilience Fund um, for Mary Magdalene Community Interest Company. Hi, Sharat. Thanks for coming Hi. along. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, everybody. Really nice to have the chance to spend some time and talk to you about your work. Um, so let's start there. Tell us a little bit about what you do. Yeah, the, the, the Mary Magdalene Project um, DIC was uh, set up um, around about... Uh, around about 2016 um it was uh it's located in a, an old gothic 1876 um church building uh, that was abandoned for nearly 30 years um the the church became derelict because of due to debts uh that the the church took out and unfortunately because of the outstanding debts uh, the the church decided that they were no longer gonna 
continue operating their, in their business from here. So therefore, uh, we ended up um, buying the church out, um, which is a really, really interesting story because the, the church was bankrupt, like I said, and uh, it needed a lot of repairs and it was still does need a lot of repairs with the roofs always leaking. <laughs> but we uh, believe that we're doing some good work in, in our community and uh, this uh, small uh, centre that we've got in, our, in the heart of our in the community uh, provides those opportunities uh, for families, uh, young people, uh, and people that get released from prison. And so tell us a little bit more about that work with ex-offenders, because I know that's a, a really kind of unique part of what you do, isn't it? Yeah, uh, we've uh, we've uh, we've gone from strength to strength uh, in the last few years uh, with all with the team that we've got and uh, the services that we provide. One of our key strengths is uh, we work with offenders uh, that get released from prison. Um, we are the only hub in, uh, in Bradford that provides... Uh, a resettlement work for lads from especially uh, that get released uh, to take part in community result, uh, resettlement work, which will allow them uh, to get involved in community-based provisions in their local area. The key to what the programme is, is to get them to stop re-offending and not going back into prison. Um, and I think the intervention work that we do uh, allows us to stop them from getting involved in uh, all sorts of uh, crime and get involved in uh, other positive um, positive affirmations which allow them to kind of deter them away from crime. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't work. We don't have a magic wand, but what we do provide uh, the lads is a sense of belief, a sense of hope that when they do get released into the community, that somebody actually is outside waiting for them. As part of that programme, the, the centre, we also run uh, what we call a confession project. We are sat inside this beautiful cell, as you can see, um, <laughs> which allows us uh, to talk to young people uh, about the, the world of criminality, which gives them an insight of the different aspects of uh, antisocial behaviour or the hate crime, the, the knife crime, the guns, uh, give them the insight of if they get involved in this kind of work, uh, the prisons uh, will be the, the place that they will end up. So it's a, it's a fair factor uh, to allow young people to, to kind of uh, realise that there is more opportunities from out there to take part in, but getting involved in crime will lead them to a prison cell like themselves uh, and also will uh, allow them to kind of destroy uh, their future. So it's it's kind of giving them uh, an, a real insight of uh, the prison, prison justice system. Stay away from that kind of work. The only way you could do it is getting away with, uh, you know, uh, with the bad people that you, you, you're kind of mixing with. So that's a, a project that we deliver part of the, the, the centre. But um, then we've got the, the usual genetic programmes that we've got uh, with the, the centre, with the Duke of Edinburgh Awards, the outdoor education programmes, the, the Zumba classes for, for, for the families, for the ladies. Uh, we do the cook and eat sessions. Uh, we have a, a youth club nights. Uh, we have boxing nights. We have taekwondo nights. We have, uh, you know, martial arts nights. I'm just starting of them. We have uh, a programme called Dads, Lads and Lasses, uh, basically, um, which allows absent fathers to get involved with uh, outdoor education with their children in, in terms of bonding their relationship uh, and kind of building those those ties with, with their children. It sounds like everything a Manningham resident would need really to you know stay healthy and well and connect with their community and kind of keep strong and resilient at this time. It's, 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 it's yeah know, it's interesting. If I had to compare our centre to other centres uh, and if we were a heavyweight boxer we'd be pound for pound one of the one of the big centres that could provide some real good quality stuff um, because I look at the the best sport programmes that we deliver and the, the, the vast amount of different programmes that we provide. Um, you know, you, you can't turn around and say, well, we're bored, there's nothing to do because here at the centre, there's everything, you know, from, from archery to climbing to bike rides, to bike repairs to, you know, from getting involved in cooking each session, you name it, we we will provide it for you uh, here at the centre. Brilliant. So really, really community-led in that in that respect, which is great, great to hear. And um, I mean, what I can see, which other people uh, listening, of course, won't be able to see, is that where you mentioned the cell that you're in, and I think the way that that becomes real for young people is a really important part of your, your programme as well because you know it's it's a real thing isn't it to um be able to imagine what it's like in a cell 
and to see that and to feel that and to spend time in that and for that to be tangible is like is really powerful um, and the fact that you've kind of done that within the church setting as well is um pretty special so I'm um, glad that you know we've been able to support that and um I'd like to hear a little bit more really about what it was like to turn the church into that community space because you do work across faiths don't you with the whole community yes we do um I think uh, the uh, we the support that we've got uh, from our partners uh, uh, allows us to to develop this kind of work um, and kind of get the message out because uh, the referrals we're getting from the from the police crime commissioners from the the prisons uh, the people from the yachts uh, and all the youth workers uh, around the one-to-one -one need for the young person is unbelievable and this space gives us an opportunity to kind of have those difficult conversations with young people uh, about what's uh, some of the changes that they need to take place in their life uh, mm. to make them a better person. So we decided that this was an ideal uh, opportunity to to develop uh, a provision like this where people could come and use this space to kind of have those conversations uh, that can't normally take place uh, in, a, in, a, in a setting uh, without having to see the real effect of, of what, what the actual uh, discussion is going to take place. So, so yeah, we're kind of fortunate to be the only centre in Bradford that has a prison cell. Uh, in a church, you know, so we get a lot of parents saying to them, please lock them up for 24 hours, keep them here. Um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, what? we'll, uh, you know, we'll, we'll pick them up in the morning. I'm like, no, nope. uh, you know, we'll just, we just have to show them what it looks like uh, and let them go away and think about, uh, you know, whether they want to uh, continue on that same journey uh, and or they want to do something positive. So, yeah, we, yeah. we try to have a bit of a spin on it to make sure that uh, parents understand that it's not a matter of just having to put a, put this uh, kids in, in, in a cell for a few hours just to, just to scare them off a little bit because uh, that's not what we're all about. No, I can imagine a sort of earned income stream that you could develop with parents offering to give you money to uh, put their kids oh, yeah. in the cell, but that's not, definitely, definitely, definitely not a road you want to go down, is it? Um, so listen, you've talked a little bit about the challenges for young people, but what have you found have been the challenges and the opportunities for you as an organisation during during the pandemic? Oh, last nine months. I think I've been more busy in the last nine months than I have been for the last few years because uh, the whole game changed um, in terms of how we work, uh, how we conduct our business, uh, how we provide services. And one thing we realised was during the COVID uh, for the last nine months was there's a, there was a lot of families uh, that needed a lot of support one-to-one. Uh, -one. So we started to get involved with the, the food parcels. We started to get involved with the door-to-door -door services. We started to get involved with the one-to-one the -one, uh, the shopping and making sure that these families were actually taken care of because we're in the heart of the uh, the, the Manningham BDA area and we have a lot of um, social housing, which means that there was a lot of elderly uh, residents that couldn't get out and uh, provide themselves uh, food. So we were having to do door knocking and provide the the, the more destitute people uh, with uh, the one to one with the with food banks uh, provisions to make sure that they they kept going during the difficult time uh, and also just to check up on them to find out that there's people around the corner that are making sure that they're actually fine. So that was one of the one of our main key challenges for the last nine months that we had. But we also realised that people's morale uh, and their motivation became so low that they felt they there wasn't anything to do. Um, and during the lockdown, well, as the, the tiers dropped from tier three to tier two, we started to do a bit more positive attitude, uh, getting young people more involved with physical activities, taking families out on, on small day trips, getting them out to the countryside, getting more physical and telling them about, you know, how to look after themselves. At the same time, as getting the message of the COVID to them to make sure that they, they're constantly reviewing the COVID uh, you know, uh, guidelines to make sure that they're staying safe. One of the, the most difficult times we dealt with during this time was death. We had lots of deaths in our community. There was lots of uh, families, members that they couldn't visit. There was lots of family members that I lost during the COVID, which we uh, couldn't see uh, as, a, as a result of COVID. We had to kind of show the community the support that we needed to say that there is help for you to outside, uh, you know, if you need somebody to talk to. That's good to hear. And, and a really good sign of the trust that you've got in communities that people came to you at that time and through those challenges. And, you know, thank you for doing that for communities, because it's really difficult work and it's really 
you know, it's really hard stuff to pick up and it's going to be ongoing. And um, so, you know, I think it's wonderful that we've got organisations like you that are trusted in our communities that can have those conversations and support people in that way. Um, I mean, it sounds like there's been lots of challenges, Sharat, and I know that, you know, we've been really lucky to partner with you through the Resilience Funding. Hopefully that's helped a little bit with those challenges in some ways. I know it's yes, been able it to help you deliver and help you look at your organisational uh, development as well as a as a charity. So tell us a bit more about how you've used it. Yeah, uh, we um, we were fortunate to uh, receive some uh, support from yourselves. Um, we sat down with our uh, management committee and our our, our steering groups and said uh, we've never faced this kind of situation before, where our income generation uh, for the centre uh, has come down to absolute zero, and all our user groups, uh, all our uh, partners, all our uh, agencies that uh, use our centre. Uh, will not be here for for a long period of time. So what that meant was we had to go back to the drawing board um, and we looked at uh, the support that we were given from yourself uh, and we've started to develop a, a business plan uh, as, a, as a result uh, of the, the support that we got. Uh, and that give us, that's now giving us an idea uh, in the next four or five years where we need to be uh, and what we need to be doing uh, in order to survive. Uh, if this something like this ever does reoccur again. So it gives an opportunity to start looking at some of the, the policies, start looking at our financial um, reserves, start looking at uh, our our management style. We start looking at uh, how we deliver some of our programmes. Uh, we got some coaching um, advice as well uh, from uh, funders and partners to tell us uh, what the kind of different pots are available for long term. Uh, where you could apply for and also short-term grants that you could tap into as well which are very three months or six months or, or a year's uh, project. Uh, we're now looking at something sustainable long-term projects uh, for a year, a couple of years now rather than going for short-term grants because once they finish we're having to go back again and to reapply so part of the business planning was to kind of look at uh, how we're going to uh, look at sustainable uh, income for, that, for our centre Fantastic. Well, I'm really glad to hear it's had some of that impact for you. And, you know, I take my if I had a hat, I would take my hat off to you because Thank I think, you, you know, doing that future thinking work is really hard alongside the delivery that you've got going on and the, you know, the needs that you've got in communities and that demand increasing to manage those two scary. things at once. Yeah, we've never done it and we didn't know what to do. I'm like, so we're having to make phone calls and we're having to ask people for help uh, and and there's one thing we're not scared of is asking people for help. If we don't know, we're gonna we're gonna ring you. We're gonna say, "Could you help us?" There's a lot of strong collaboration in Bradford, isn't there? and uh, it's really nice to see it come into the fore at a it's difficult nice. time it's like nice. this. Nice. So, can you tell us a few um, stories of some people that have been supported through your work over this time? Yes, I'll, I'll give you two examples. Um, during the confession project, we had a lad um, that came out of prison during COVID. He was inside uh, prison for drug dealing and he's, he's, a, he's a persistent drug dealer. So he found out that he was out uh, in the community. So we got involved from the referrals that were given by the prison. The, the lad that comes now, uh, he started to take part in the programs that we do here, which involves him taking part in the physical activities like the boxing. Uh, he also started to do some of the bike repairs that we do at the centre and also kind of talked to him about why he does his drug dealing uh, and maybe could uh, turn that life lifestyle around uh, into something a bit more positive uh, and kind of talk to young people uh, about the negatives of um, of drug dealing. So what we did was um, we started to uh, use him as a, as a as a mentor for young people, where we basically, uh, he's talking to young people about crime, about how if they get involved in uh, the wrong crowd, that the, the crime will result in prison um, uh, sentencing. So he now comes regular to the centre, uh, the centre here, uh, and gets involved. And last week we had the look north that we're doing some filming here on Tuesday. Um, they're going to be producing a documentary this week, possibly uh, Touchwood, uh, about uh, his uh, his uh, his lifestyle changes uh, and the support that we've given him. And that's because of the the community resilient fund that we've got allowed us to work in the prisons and also continue working in the in the communities uh, to support people like him who got involved. Uh, in the project uh, that is helping others now uh, to change their lives. So uh, we're, we're kind of really fortunate to have uh, something uh, to kind of show for. 
Oh, that's brilliant. Well, I hope I hope to meet that young man at some point. Um, yeah, he's, really he's, great he's, story. He's a character. Uh, he's got a lot of stories, um, and uh, you, you're getting talking about prison. Uh, he can never he can never be quiet. Trust me. Imagine if if you were in the same cell as him for 23 hours. You know, you, you, you're gonna you're gonna keep uh, occupied. Uh, you know, because he's got that many stories. Um, but yeah, it's, it's good to know that he's uh, he's turned his life around, uh, and he's, he's he's actually doing something positive now, um, and trying to stay away. We've, we've helped him with his family. We've helped him with his children. We helped him with his, you know try to get back on, on his feet with some employment. So the small things that will make a difference are the ones that are really where he needed uh, the intervention. Now he's giving that back to the community that where where he lives. So it's nice to see uh, and, and a good a positive outcome as a result of uh, the support that we got. Fantastic. Thanks, Sharat. That's really nice to hear. And um, just before you go, I wanted to ask you. Um, you know, there'll be a lot of people listening to this podcast who are thinking about giving time or giving money to make a difference in their community. What advice would you give them? Please go and help these people, uh, you know, in whatever capacity you could give them, uh, in whether it's volunteering time or whether it's any support, uh, you know, whether it's with some food outlets, uh, you know, that will go a long way uh, in terms of, you know, bringing, you know, the, uh, showing that the community is, is there to support each other during difficult times. So, uh, I would, you know, I would encourage everyone to do their little bit for the community. We take pride in what we do, um, and the, the work that we do here at the centre clearly shows, you know, the the families, uh, the elderly, the young people that we support, uh, and we're going to continue doing that um, during uh, the good times and also uh, the difficult times. And hopefully, you know, Give Bradford will be here. Well, we will be here alongside you for the positives and the negatives of what's to come but you know you doing an interview like this makes a big difference because if our donors hear it then you know they're going to keep giving to campaigns brilliant Sharat Hussain from Mary Magdalene CIC thank you so much for joining us thank you for having us and uh, thank you for coming to my uh, cell so our next guest on the podcast is Kathy Henwood from Wellsprings Together, who've partnered with us on our COVID-19 Healthy Holidays funding and have done a lot of work to support and organise um, the food response to the pandemic at this time. Healthy Holidays is a programme where community organisations deliver activities during the school holidays to enable vulnerable children to access food, activities, learning and support. Since the start of the pandemic, it's been extended with support from Give Bradford donors to run year round. Welcome, Cathy. Thank you. Thanks for joining us. Um, can you tell us a little bit about Wellsprings Together and the programme that you've been running? So um, Wellsprings Together is a, a joint venture with the sort of Church of England, Diocese of Leeds and, and, and Wellsprings Together, which is an independent little charity. And um, we're involved in lots of programmes around social inclusion, loneliness and, and a, a big programme around food, which I'm involved in. And I'm particularly involved in the, the work in Bradford. So um, that project's called Feeding Bradford and Keithley, where we have a lot of different partners from food banks, soup kitchens and, and healthy holiday programmes. Many, many of those are partnered to, to Feeding Bradford and Keithley too. So, um, you know, I'm very much embedded in the food poverty work across the district. And I guess food poverty is one of the areas that um, has seen a huge increase in demand over the period of the pandemic. Is that right? Yes, I think particularly back in March, April, May, the, the demand was were huge. Lots of people were really struggling with the, the first lockdown. And I think it was very much highlighted by both your healthy holiday scheme, but, but other groups as well, that, that families were really struggling with, with kids being home from school and, and being reliant on those school free school meals and not not just getting them so therefore really struggling having to feed their kids three meals a day not not just um having their main meal already provided when they're at school yeah and lots of challenges for families and communities in different ways i guess our community organizations across bradford and keithley have been responding in different ways to those challenges as well can you tell us a bit about that yes i mean i think there's been a, a fantastic response um and, and i think you know the sort of programs that people are running through the healthy holiday covid response were really varied and they varied as, as time went on as well. I mean, lots of them initially did food parcels and activity packs. And some of those were really, really imaginative. I was really quite excited about, for example, in churches, um, they did uh, um, really good quality cooking demonstrations online and then gave out food parcels so families could cook together. So there's an activity and the food sort of rolled into one. And um, some organisations mostly focus on the food, some organisations mostly focus on, focus on the activity, but there was a real range. And certainly my feedback from the um, organisations was they really appreciated that flexibility to meet the needs of their community in the way that they felt 
was best as well. Fantastic. So lots of community organisations kind of really getting into communities and, and standing alongside people and listening to what they need from their work. That's right. And we, we heard some fantastic stories. Of another one, um, an organisation, FAB, which works with a lot of dis disabled children, just how much the children were sort of there waiting for, for their packs of activities and food to sort of come along and how it just became the highlight of their days. And that programme, they also did a, a regular, even daily Zoom, I think, um, in the height of the pandemic, with the kids getting together and having like a youth club on, online and having quizzes and, and lots of things. And um, again, it's a fantastic commitment, you know, way, way beyond anything they were paid to deliver, <laughs> the amount of time that went into that. Um, and just, you know, families giving that feedback that it was sort of the highlight of the day. It was something to look forward to finding out, you know, the packs coming sometimes without them knowing what was going to be in them meant that it was an exciting thing to look look forward to, to see what was there, what they were going to get, what they could make, what they could play with. So really providing those parents sort of who were trying to help home educate, were trying to look after their kids 24-7 with some real break because something new was coming in, some input from elsewhere, um, which I think, again, was a real, real appreciated alongside the food. It sounds like it's been providing hope to families as well as food and things to do yes I think that's 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 a really good way of putting it I think you know hope, hope and and contact you know, people saying that actually though even those two minute conversations on the doorstep might have been the two minute conversation that that family had from outside especially in the early days that sense that other people were out there looking out for their needs other people were concerned about them that they weren't alone so hope and and just care love maybe even um, those are all, all words which seem to be part of it you know so many different organizations doing such good work I, I felt really inspired to be sort of part of it in more in a networking and supporting way but to sort of be part of that huge effort that was going on yeah and I think it's been a really important part of the response organizations like yours playing that connecting role and sharing ideas and sharing resources between our small community organizations across the district because you know, for the leaders of those organisations and volunteers and communities that are going above and beyond, it's it's tiring, isn't it? And it's, um, you know, it's difficult to start from scratch with some of those new um, opportunities and things that have needed to be put in place. So to be that that cog in the middle, you know, really important. Yes, and it was really good to be able to link organisations in. I mean, like you say, said before, there's a big outpouring of goodwill and, and some would say the community arts organisations, which didn't maybe get funding, but they then thought, well, actually, we want to give out and support activity packs. And because the Healthy Holiday Programme was running, I could say, yes, we'll do them by, by this programme. And, you know, we can link together and provide resources to those, those organisations so they don't have to reinvent the wheel. But we also did simple things like little news, email newsletters and, and just put in silly stories and pictures and ways of sharing ideas that people could sort of, you learn something good from somewhere and you could say, hey, this really worked. Um, what about thinking about doing that in your area and you know and there were some fantastic programs that happened in that way too I mean for example um Gateway um Ravenscliffe Community Centre they they got really into doing street dancing and could do that um sort of socially distanced street dancing in various streets and and that sort of went sort of got really really popular and other people thought well what else can we do in the streets in that way and, and again bringing some fun bringing some entertainment um but all in a sort of safe way that just got people involved. So, um, you know, I, I would have really loved to be there. I did, but I saw it online. It was really great. Yeah. I think we're all desperate to get back out onto the street and do a bit of dancing, Kathy. When we do, yeah. <laughs> um, and you know, it sounds like there's been some fantastic impacts and lots of opportunities for um, for people to be creative and support each other in different ways. What what have been the challenges of the work? Would you say? Um, I think oh, lots of lots of challenges, I'm sure, as well. I mean, in the early days, there was a real challenge to even get hold of food. Um, and that was, you know, a challenge for the families and a challenge for the projects. You know, they sort of say, well, how do we access food? Um, I could, was able to put them in touch with organisations like um, Fair Shares, which which um, which can support support some of them um, with with food in churches in, in Bradford, which are going um, re disputes food from them which would have gone to waste so so I was able to link them up with that uh, I think also people found you know it's very time consuming and and how to how to do things you know that things were taking a lot longer deliveries and things um, um, so again networking them in with um, other sources of volunteers um, the, the Bradford Volunteer Centre was sort of 
very willing to to sort of be contacted and 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 had lots of volunteers offering as well. There was, there was lots of offering, and it was it was putting putting those things together really that was the key really. And I know that um, a lot of the organisations that you've been working with who've been doing this this community support on the ground you know they haven't been able to for example take advantage of the furlough scheme there hasn't been a lot of funding available for this kind of work traditionally what do you see as the future for community organizations doing this kind of thing and I think Covid has shown what a lifeline they are to so many people doesn't it and you know I think in some ways it's really championed it's really championed our, our sector, but also it has really un- undermined our sector. People have really struggled um, sometimes to access funds and um, and that's been really, really hard. So certainly so organisations talked about how it's important to have flexible funding because they were finding they weren't doing what they'd been paid to do. And some organisations, I think the lottery and others have been very flexible about how funding was spent. Um, I certainly know that, you know, some. I, I regret that some organisations may cease to exist and, and that is really sad. But then many have managed to access special COVID funding and have really appreciated things like the healthy holiday funding and the resilience grants um, from Give Bradford. So that's made a big difference. And I think hopefully donors will see that as well and see that that's really crucial to allow people to deal with what is rather than what had originally been planned. I think you're right. I think the kind of um, word we've been using a lot is pivot. Organisations have been you know, pivoting completely from having had a plan to do something up until March and now often doing something very, very different and reflecting on whether what they should be doing is the new thing or the old thing or a bit of both and how to do it in terms of face to face and technology. So huge amounts of change going on in the sector and some of that's really really positive but as funders we need to find ways to support that and we have had a huge amount of investment into the district um, for the COVID-19 pandemic which has been brilliant but I think what happens next you know there's still a huge amount of work to do in securing funding and support for organisations to continue as we rebuild after the pandemic. I wanted to ask you as well about the council. Um, So obviously the council have, of course, funded a lot of activity in response to the pandemic. And um, nationally, we were noted in Bradford, weren't we, by Chris Whitty and the government as a kind of beacon of good practice, which is brilliant. So, um, you know, it seems to me that everybody's pulling together across sectors at this time to play their part. How have you found it working with the council as a community organisation? And we we worked quite closely with the council um, in terms of the food bank work in particular. uh, we were, you know, we were called upon to try and, um, as as we were the people that, that knew where the food banks were, knew knew what people were doing, um, to, to sort of be a link um, and work very closely with other organisations to make sure that they got food um, out to the food banks. We also worked with some of the soup kitchens in a similar way to make sure they got information and, and PPE and things like that. Um, and and also the council did decide to put some money into the healthy holiday type program as well and and I was able to sort of make sure we shared addresses and um, made sure people knew about what funding was available so um, I think that's one thing that has changed maybe for the better um, during the during the um, pandemic is more people in the council have been aware of the roles of organisations like um, Wellsprings Together and Feeding Bradford and Keithley really so that they are now turning to us to ask us that information rather than digging around and maybe only finding half the information themselves they, they know that they'll get a bigger picture if they if they work with people like ourselves. Thanks Cathy that's good to hear and have you got any other stories of um, individuals that have been helped through healthy holidays that you want to share? Oh I have lots of stories it's it's hard to choose them in many ways. Um, I was just thinking about um, Bevan House which was one one of my projects that was funded Um, and they work with um, refugees, asylum seekers, people who are homeless so so some of our most needy and and, um, deprived families and, and what I was really impressed about the, them was how bespoke they, they made their work to people. You know, if one family really wanted some more help around um, maths or English, they, they tried to include that in the packs. Um, one girl was, was got really into cooking and, and they provided her with sort of more cooking things like, you know, frying pan and, and cake tins um, and made sure that she got extra resources around baking and things because that was something that had really inspired her. And, you know, it's great to see that sort of thing where people are able to really sort of tailor them to, to the needs of that particular family. Um, and another thing, actually, you know, as, as projects were beginning later on, um, as the summer moved on to, to be able to see people face to face again. Um, and um, the Eccles Hill um, 
adventure playground, which is now called Play Bradford, I think. And they were telling me about how, what a difference it made to those individual children, that the children had come in sort of seeming quite withdrawn or sometimes a bit aggressive and and really struggling and, and a few hours playing in, 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 in bubbles in a safe way, but had made such a difference that the kids had turned back into the cheeky kids which they'd known before the pandemic. And just seeing that difference that the play made to children and how crucial play is. I mean, that again is an, another really inspiring story. Yeah, thanks, Cathy. And I think that, um, you know, what you were saying about the bespoke and personalised approach that community organisations are able to take is so important. And um, there's, you know, there's a big difference between providing some food and providing some food and activities that are right for the individuals that are the people behind the stories. So, yeah, really inspiring. Thank you. Um, I'm going to ask you if I can put you on the spot a little bit with this last question, Cathy. Um, we have lots of people listening who, you know, will, will be wanting to make a difference in their community at the moment, maybe with their money or maybe with their time. What advice would you give them? Ah, well, there's there's lots of things I think you can do. And I think try and network in with other people because it's wonderful that so many people actually maybe want to go out and, and feed somebody who seems to be homeless or or whatever. But if you can link in with others, you can make sure that the food's going to the people that really need it. Sometimes we know that people may be struggling around food are the people that aren't visible on the streets. And some of those are, are more more struggling maybe than the person who who is apparently homeless. That, that's just one example. So, so I think linking with other organisations um, that are already involved because they know, um, you know who needs the help most. Um, they're often really, really keen to have people get involved and volunteer with them. Um, you know, there's also things like uh, Volunteer Bradford. Um, that's a great place if you've got time. If you've got money, then the food banks are always welcome for donations of food or money as well. And we have got, I'll just plug a, a, a new website that we've just developed called um, um, Find Food in Bradford. And it's www.bradfordfoodbanks.org.uk. And that has information about where people can find food if they need it, but also where you can donate to all these organisations as well, whether that's your time or your money. Um, and that's a great place to look um, if you're wanting to support people, especially around the issue of food poverty. But many of the community organisations that do activities and fun, you know, your local community centre also is a great place to, to, to offer support to. Fantastic. We we do love a good plug. Uh, give love Bradford. Thank you, Cathy. That's <laughs> that's great to hear. Um, well, Cathy Henwood from Wellsprings Together, thank you very much for your time and for all you're doing for our communities across Bradford and Keighley. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed those conversations. For me, they really brought to life what a time of great challenge and opportunity this is for communities and what can be achieved with the support of our donors and partners across the district. Having grown up here and moved back in March 2020 after a long career in community work, charity leadership and funding, I'm really delighted to have the chance through this podcast to get to know some of the organisations across our district better. I hope you'll enjoy learning with me about the brilliant work that makes Bradford the fantastic place that it is. I'm definitely inspired by those stories, I have to say, to keep fundraising and collaborating for the benefit of the district. And I really hope, having heard this, that you are too. Well, that's it for our first episode. Thank you for listening. And thanks so much again to Sharat and Cathy for joining me today at Give Bradford. If you enjoyed this episode, take a couple of seconds to rate it on your favourite podcast platform. Don't forget to follow us on Facebook, Instagram and Twitter and subscribe to our newsletter. And you can visit our website at givebradford.org.uk. Feel free to email us at givebradford at leadcf.org.uk. Speak to you soon for the next episode of Give Love Bradford. Give Love Bradford.